Hi, good morning, Mario. How are you today? Good morning, Amanda. Hi, good morning. How are you? 
Uh, not too bad, thank you. Uh, I never saw a prompt uh, to get connected by uh, telephone. So your voice came in very well just now. So I think I'm just going to go use the audio system on my computer. That's fine. You can always select. Um, on your dashboard, you can click on the audio drop down and change it to phone call. And yeah. when you select that option, it will give you all of the call in details that you need. So okay. should something occur and you need to, you can do that. We will, be, right. muting, we will be muting everyone as we get started, but I have opened it up for now in case anyone would like to say hello as we um, get our morning started and afternoon started, depending on where you are in the world, um, before we hear from Martha Moore. So good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us. We're going to keep it open for just a few moments until we get started in the next uh, 10, 12 minutes or so. How is everyone? Well, we're, we're, well I'm fine. Excellent. Yep, I'm, I'm fine. And, uh, I see it looks like we've got about uh, nine, 10 or so attendees online. So good morning to everyone. I see uh, Joel and um, Ichiro, Katja and Mario. So nice to have you all on here this morning. See some new faces, new names. I don't see the faces yet, but I see some new names coming on. I am from Ametsa Fiber and I'm happy to join this webinar. Oh, very, very nice. Nice to speak with you. I'd actually like to schedule some time um, with you, Katja, to speak a little further with you about uh, METSA and some collaborative efforts in the future. So as I get through our presentation today, uh, I'll be showing my calendar and um, I'd like for us to, to schedule some time if we can. Okay, that sounds good. Thanks. I am actually I'm new to this app, so I don't know how to <laughs> introduce to <laughs> the through the camera. I don't know which kind of button I should press, but yeah, we're gonna mute everyone shortly. And so if I uh, and I'll get into some housekeeping. Um but Right now, everyone is open. If you want to unmute to say hello or introduce yourself, um, it looks like we do have Martha Moore coming on. So, very excited to get Martha Moore's presentation started this morning. Hi, Martha. Oh, can't hear you. Oh, do we have her muted? Okay, great. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> technology. We're all working <laughs> through technology these days. For sure. Thanks for joining us this morning, Martha. How is everything in DC these days? Good, good. Although I'm hoping we're not going to be disturbed. We're in the middle of our cicada um, bloom, I guess, this 17-year uh, cicada. So it's been a little noisy. I've closed all the windows, but... <laughs> Yeah, that's a, I've seen a swarm of those before and it's a little frightening when you see them. It's, it's a little unnerving. Yeah, <laughs> you feel like yeah. they're going to carry you off. <laughs> yeah, 17 years ago when it was bad, um, I had one fly in the car with me and uh, got in my hair. Yeah, <laughs> I, I don't know how I escaped that one, but uh, yeah, that was a little hair raising. <laughs> you can keep them there. We'll let you keep those up in DC. Yes. <laughs> All right. So we've got a few minutes here as we've got everyone joining. Looks like we should have a fairly good turnout today. Uh, we had people still registering this morning. And so Wendy, I think, has the final number, but I know that we were well over 100 registrants. Fantastic. Now, remind me, I've got how long? Um, so I've got you scheduled until 10 o'clock so that we can allow for some questions and answers as well. And okay. so as we get started, I'll let everyone know that their questions can be entered in through the question or through the chat feature directly to the staff or organizers so that we can see those and um, we'll be answering those at the end of your presentation. Great. 
So you should be able to see some of those as they come through too, but if not, then I'll send them to you privately. That way you can take a look at them um, as opposed to just me reading them out to you. Great. Okay. So everyone has all of their lovely virtual <laughs> setting in the background. I'm showing my daughter. She's graduating this year. Oh, she congratulations. Actually, yeah, she graduates June 7th, as does Wendy's son, Colby. You can probably see him on her board there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they're both graduating on June 7th. And because of the lovely coronavirus, COVID-19, <laughs> We're just going, we're going back traditional and we're having the graduation in the stadium of the high school. So, oh, great. yeah, so we're going back and just bringing it right here into the community and we're just praying it doesn't rain <laughs> since it will be at nine yes. o'clock in the morning on a Monday morning. But okay. certainly um, for those of you who know our kids and have seen our kids at different events and throughout the years, they're, they're leaving the nest but that's okay we still have our pca family <laughs> we have a big pca family we're growing our pca family so that's certainly exciting since we can't grow our family any further except for wendy with her grandbabies <laughs> <laughs> wendy has her grandbabies as well <laughs> all right I see that we have Tony McLeod on, our trusty uh, legal counsel. Okay, so it looks like we've got quite a number of people starting to come in now. So that's good. We'll get started here in the next five minutes or so. Wendy, remind me, remind me how I share my screen. I'm not, I'm not used to this particular setup. I'm going to change the presenter mode to you. Okay. Okay. So, um, you should see something now that comes up on your screen. Yeah. And then you can click yes. There you go. Okay. Just did. Yep. Is it showing my presentation? Uh, right now it's just showing the connected to go to webinar. Okay. So, so I'll change. Yeah. I'll change it back to me for the moment. Okay, and okay. What, what, are you working off of multiple monitors? I am, I've got two monitors, so I may just need a little okay. guidance. Let me know if it doesn't look right and I need to switch screens or something so I can, I can do that. No, that's fine. What I would say is, do you know which monitors are number one, number two, number three? Oh gosh. Okay, it's very simple. If you go down into your settings and then go to your devices and tell it to identify the screen, you'll know which monitor is one, two, or three. Identify devices. It should show at the very bottom of your screen, one, two, or three. Mm. Okay, so I'm in the start menu. Do I go to like control panel or something? Let's try that. And hardware and should be under your display. Display. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm old. Oh, let me try to. Well, I only have the two screens, so we try try okay. number two first, or try number one okay. first, and then, yeah. Okay, what you can do is um, if you go into PowerPoint, when you look at the very um, top menu bar, here, I'm gonna back out of mine for a second, so I can tell you. If you go to slideshow, mm -hmm. you, should, you should see an option that says monitor, and you can tell it which monitor you want to go to, monitor one or monitor two. Okay. Oh, and I so see. the screen that I was seeing was the one that just said connected to go to meeting. So whichever that screen was is the one that was showing. Got it. But okay. you, can, you can change your I monitor see. there. I see where that setting is. Okay, perfect. Yeah. There you go. All right. 
Good morning, Tony. Good morning, Amanda. Hi, Martha. Wendy, hello. Everybody else, hello. Thanks for joining us today, Tony. How is everything up in the north? It's wonderful. We're finally getting <laughs> Florida weather. Yeah, finally, good. <laughs> All right. So it looks like we're getting everyone coming on board here. So give it just a few minutes to get started. Yeah, we're right here at nine o'clock. So if it, everyone would bear with us just a moment, we see a good number of people trying to come in here right at the, the nine o'clock hour. So we'll give them just a moment to, to get in and get settled. What was our final number, Wendy? 110. Okay, so we have 110 people registered for the event. So I know that even at oh, 8.30 this morning, um, people were still trying to come in to register from our release of our email and our report yesterday. So that's exciting. I know last year, we, um, I think we only had about half of those or maybe about a third of those that were attending. So we're excited for everyone to attend. I know that I've received a good number of um, emails and comments that everyone's very excited to hear from Martha Moore today and what her outlook is for our very uncertain future. So we're, uh, we thank Martha for being here. Um, since it is right here at nine o'clock, as people are finishing, um, I will just go through a few housekeeping um, rules. I'm going to be muting everyone now. So the only one who should be able to speak are just uh, who we unmute or Martha, Wendy, or myself. Um, if anyone has any questions at any time, there is a feature that's online to where you can raise your hand or on your GoToWebinar uh, menu toolbar, you should see an option for questions or to chat. As you get in, you can send a question to um, Martha, you can send a question to the host PCA um, meeting host, or you can send a chat to us. If you have a question, please send that directly to the meeting host so that Wendy and I can see those. If there's any uncertainty with the questions, then those will be vetted with our legal counsel to ensure that we are not violating any type of antitrust rules. And then as Martha finishes up, we will do a question and answer um, with her. So we'll be prompting her with the questions that you're asking throughout her presentation, as well as anything that comes up subsequently. So, as we're getting started here, um, first of all, I want to say welcome to everyone. Um, we're certainly glad that you're joining us. I know that we were hoping to be able to return to face-to-face -face meetings again this year, but unfortunately that is not possible for us. Um, so we're very fortunate that we do have the technology to bring our wonderful Martha Moore back to give us an update and to be able to provide an update for the activities and projects that the PCA currently is working on. With that, I am going to get started here to where we can get into our antitrust policy. So with that, 
Um, Tony, I am going to bring this to you so that you can do an antitrust reminder and let everyone know that orange is not my new black. <laughs> Nor should your stripes be uh, vertical. Exactly. Don't look okay. well in either. Or horizontal, I guess. <laughs> At any rate, thank you, Amanda. Uh, as usual, uh, you all know that uh, PCA meetings are bound by a strict uh, uh, spirit of compliance with the uh, federal antitrust laws of the United States and any applicable competition laws uh, of countries in which our members operate. Uh, the antitrust policy is posted on the screen, and I commend it to your reading pleasure. Uh, I will be listening in on the meeting to make sure that there is no discussion of uh, prices, industry margins, company costs, future production plans of any particular uh, competitor, uh, no effort to divide up markets, territories, or customers. Uh, and uh, I certainly don't think that there's going to be any bid rigging going on during the course of, uh, say, Martha's presentation or any part of this uh, meeting. Uh, at any rate, I will be listening in. If I hear anything, uh, you will hear further from me if, uh, in fact, Amanda will let me out of my audio cage. Uh, with that, uh, thank you, Amanda. Have a good meeting. I will keep your uh, microphone unmuted, Tony. So if you want to mute yourself, then I'll leave I you. Will, I'll take control. care of my muting. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, sir. Okay. Well, with that, thank you very much. Moving right along, uh, we do have Martha Moore scheduled this morning to speak until 10 a.m. And then we will enter into our business meeting well, where we will provide some updates. Um, again, I want to thank everyone for participating today. I think we can all agree that this has been a year like no other, but we are coming through this. We're emerging. We're emerging resiliently, and so we appreciate your patience as we've been working through getting this presentation set up for you, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Martha Moore. Wendy, if you could uh, make Martha the presenter, please, I would appreciate that. Uh, Martha has joined us several times before, and she's the Senior Director for Policy um, Analysis and Economics with the American Chemistry Council. Um, she has played various roles with them, and in her job opportunities <laughs> with American Chemistry Council, she has analyzed the impact of policy initiatives and energy trends on the chemical industry. So she has a very um, dynamic outlook and an insightful presentation prepared for us today, um, looking at the global economy and end use markets and hopefully can share some of her insight as to the trends or what are happening for the future with the pine chemicals industry. So with that, Martha, I'll turn it over to you. I'm gonna mute everyone else's microphone and everyone else's camera. So thank you for joining us today and welcome. Oh, you're muted. Let me unmute you. Sorry, thank you for the technology there. There you okay, go, Amanda. Thank you, Amanda. Um, before I get started, can everybody, I'm gonna, uh, can everybody see my screen the right way, I guess, Let's see. I just see your desktop screen now with the web. There we go. I see it perfectly now. Perfect. Okay. Um, and it's the it's the full screen view, Wendy. Okay, great. Um, yeah, thanks very much. So as always, it's a pleasure to talk to you all. I uh, get a lot out of these uh, interactions. I get some good questions from this this audience. So um, yeah, as, as Wendy sort of launched into this, this has been a year like no other. Um, you know, COVID has, has changed the way the economy has, has been operating. Whoops, there we go. Uh, yeah. Sorry, hang on guys, I'm trying to move things around. I've got a couple different screens going on. Okay, super. Um, so yeah, COVID has changed the course of business, the course of people's livelihoods around the world. This has been a, a uniquely global experience. Um, 
But you know, with the, uh, certainly in the United States and in many other parts of the world, it is starting to we're starting to turn a corner. Um, so here, I think I've shown this the last couple of times we've talked. These are the uh, daily seven-day average uh, uh, case rates. The black line is the global. The the U.S. is the light blue line. You can see that we are uh, continuing to edge lower. Um, you know, very, very good sign. CDC has relaxed uh, uh, mask regulations in large parts of the U.S. economy. Um, unfortunately, it's not the same story around the world um, as anybody who's been watching the news lately. India is in the middle of a uh, huge crisis. Um, other countries are seeing spiking rates. Malaysia, um, uh, Brazil continues to have high rates. They're coming down, uh, which is good news, but they still remain quite high. Um, so that the health crisis is alive and well in many other parts of the world. So one of the reasons that uh, cases are falling so sharply in the United States is because of the distribution of vaccines. Um, but vaccine distribution globally has been extremely uneven. So the chart on the uh, right hand side is the share of a population in the particular country or region where they have received at least one dose of COVID-19 uh, vaccine. Uh, so you can see the United States up there, uh, Canada has just edged a little higher. They've got a slightly different strategy. Um, United Kingdom is doing quite well. But if you look down um, further down, a European Union kind of got a slow start. Uh, uh, Brazil, South America, India um, are doing better than the world, but really only 10% of the world population has received one uh, dose of vaccine at this point. Uh, the chart on the on the left uh, shows the number or the percent that are fully vaccinated, and this is uh, this data is only available for certain uh, more developed countries that have the ability to track who's getting two vaccines versus just the the doses of vaccine. Um, so worldwide, only five percent of the population has been fully vaccinated against COVID-19, and the vast majority of those are in uh, developed countries like the United States. Um, and uh, uh, some countries in Europe, uh, UK especially. Uh, so Canada and Finland um, are taking a slightly different approach. Uh, there have been some supply issues with vaccines. Uh, they have been targeting getting everybody the first dose. So they're trying to get everybody to get one dose first before they start to go and uh, give people those second doses. So you can see that uh, 50, over 50% 50 of the Canadian population uh, has had at least one dose, but uh, fewer than 5% are fully vaccinated at this point. So sort of broadening out the lens now to what's going on in the global economy, uh, you can see those very negative numbers in uh, uh, 2020, 3.6% decline in global GDP. Um, that was the worst since the Great Depression. Um, but we're seeing rebounding activity in most parts of the world. We're looking for 6.1% uh, growth in global GDP in 2021, um, and still uh, uh, good rates of 4.4% is, is above trend in, in 2022. And trade is a big part of that. We've seen trade volumes uh, rebounding and industrial production. And I'll talk more about both of those. This is some really interesting data um, that I came across. It's a container throughput. So these are global containers. Um, and you can see that the, the trend in container shipments has sort of rebounded from the pandemic. Um, and the trade and industrial production indices for uh, the global economy uh, showing uh, return to trend. And you know, these are very important and it reflects sort of underlying shifting consumption patterns. And this is gonna be a theme going uh, through this presentation is as people were at home or in lockdown, um, consumption of services uh, fell sharply. Uh, so you had people who had maybe a little bit of extra money because they're not spending it on services, they're spending it on goods. And that has really juiced uh, the global manufacturing sector. These are purchasing managers indices. Um, and I think we have talked about these before in the past. Um, the way to read this chart, uh, these are for each uh, uh, of several major economies that I track. Um, a reading above 50 uh, indicates that the manufacturing sector is expanding. A reading below 50 indicates that that uh, uh, manufacturing sector is contracting. So right now we are showing uh, a growth across all of these major economies that I'm tracking. The one exception is Mexico. Um, and some of that is related to supply chain issues which I will also talk about more lately. So 
in a nutshell here, uh, global economic outlook, a worst downturn since the depression, but we are rebounding. Um, there are successful vaccination programs in many countries, um, mostly in the developing world, um, but some, some uh, 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 middle income countries as well. Uh, and some form of reopening is occurring in most places. There are some exceptions. Um, Japan has recently uh, reinstituted some, some tightening in, in several of their prefectures uh, due to, to COVID outbreaks. Um, India certainly is uh, struggling as it uh, tries to contain its health crisis. So not everywhere in the world, but most parts of the world are starting to have some kind of opening up, um, but it's uneven. Um, there's been a lot of fiscal stimulus across all economies. Um, there's a lot of excess savings. I mentioned if you're not consuming services, you've got maybe some excess savings, and that is fueling demand um, in, in both the developed and the developing world, uh, mostly in the developed world. But, um, you know, on the other side, we've got COVID cases that are remaining historically high, uh, continued crisis in, in many places. Um, growth remains uneven across economies and across sectors um, in those parts of the world where uh, COVID cases remain quite high and, and restrictions remain in place. Uh, service industries remain quite uh, hampered. Uh, we're starting to see inflation pop its head in, in many places. A lot of that is uh, driven by commodities. Um, and there are really multiple risks and uncertainties uh, around all of this forecast. So the IMF projects that world output in 2024 will still be about 3% lower than it was projected to be before the pandemic. So there are some lasting um, scarring is what uh, economists talk about to the, the economy. Underlying fundamentals um, are not going to leap back up to trend um, anytime soon. Uh, the, the, the level will be increasing, but it's not going to get to where it was, where it was expected to be before the pandemic hit. Just quickly going around the globe a little bit, um, Europe and the UK, we saw Eurozone uh, GDP and, and UK GDP fell in uh, the first quarter. Uh, they had a late resurgence of uh, a virus and there were more lockdowns. Um, there's you know new variants of concern that emerged in the UK and, and other parts of the world, but especially the UK. Uh, but going into quarter two, the second quarter where we are right now, um, lockdowns have eased. Uh, vaccination programs have ramped up, certainly in the UK. Um, it's been a less of a, of a um, they've had a rocky start in more of the EU. The AstraZeneca vaccine was a little bit slow to roll out. Um, but we see consumer spending and business investment rebounding, um, and that's going to drive growth this year and into next as relax, uh, restrictions become more relaxed. Um, especially in the UK. The UK retail sales numbers were really quite strong uh, for April, so we're starting to see a turnaround there. Um, ECB and Bank of England are continuing to provide stimulus. I think Bank of England may be starting to kind of take their foot off the accelerator. Um, but then there's a the question of long-term damage to the labor market, some of these scarring effects. Turning to Japan, I mentioned uh, there have been uh, tightening of restrictions in several parts of the country, including Tokyo. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty around what's going to happen with the Summer Olympics that are expected to be held there, um, I think, in another month or two. Uh, of course, those were postponed from last year uh, due to the pandemic, so um, it'll be interesting to see what happens. Uh, Export-oriented manufacturing has been quite strong in Japan, especially semiconductors. There's been a global semiconductor shortage, um, and Japan has is one of the major producers globally of semiconductors. Um, other manufacturing has also remained uh, resilient, especially those that are uh, export-oriented. The yen remains relatively weak, and that has been uh, providing some ex, uh, to support for exports. The TANCAN survey, which is a business sentiment uh, survey, uh, continues to improve. Um, investment is expected to rebound. And uh, there's continued fiscal and uh, monetary stimulus by the Bank of Japan. So China was the first, first to experience the COVID uh, pandemic, and they were the first to kind of get back on track. Uh, their economy started recovering uh, in the second half of 2020. Um, I've got a chart uh, coming up that shows uh, growth rates around the world. Uh, they were the only major economy to show growth in 2020. Um, but momentum has weakened in uh, recent months. Uh, household consumption actually fell in April, uh, which is a little uh, concerning. Uh, business investment growth has also slowed. 
Um, part of that is that the uh, China's uh, 14th five-year plan, which is highlighting sort of R&D development, um, and they really want to expand their, their domestic um, uh, sector and, and be less reliant on export-oriented growth. Um, they've also got some interesting green goals uh, moving towards decarbonization. Um, so China, uh, we expect, you know, still very strong growth, but uh, slightly slower pace than, uh, than might have otherwise been the trend. So India, uh, we've got uh, a, a health crisis going on in India. Rates are down from the recent peaks, which set global records for daily cases and daily deaths at one point. Um, their lockdowns uh, could continue into the third quarter. Uh, so we are, are lowering our growth prospects. So the, the chart I'm going to show, I think it's 11% growth in GDP uh, for 2021. I think we're going to have to step back from that. Uh, that uh, we're we're going to have to revise that one downward. Um, the government in India has a target to vaccinate 23% of their population by August, uh, but this has been hampered by, by vaccine supply and uh, distribution challenges. Unemployment has risen again as a result of the lockdowns um, and consumer spending, of course, has uh, uh, been constrained. Uh, we saw vehicle sales down uh, quite sharply in April. Investment recovery has been uh, delayed by renewed lockdowns um, and credit growth has slowed, uh, which of course credit is a lifeline of many businesses and that has um, slowed. So we're expecting to see some, some bumpy times in India through uh, the third quarter. But again, like the rest of the world, once, those, once the health crisis is over and um, you know, people can go back to a more normal uh, pattern of business, uh, we expect to see a rapid acceleration. So some of the other major uh, world economies that we're looking at, uh, Brazil, they renewed their lockdowns in, in the first quarter, um, but we've seen rebounding activity, at least in some of the high frequency indicators uh, in uh, second quarter. Canada, uh, they've just been uh, having a third wave and that is just starting to come under control. Um, so the stage is set for a really rapid rebound uh, in the second half of this year. Uh, Russia has, uh, we've seen higher oil prices globally. Um, that has been supportive as Russia is one of the uh, world's major oil exporters. Uh, consumer, spe consumer spending and construction spending have um, increased. Uh, there's a lot of government incentive programs for construction. So that is uh, providing stimulus to the Russian economy. Um, other emerging economies without uh, going into a true a lot of detail, um, economies that rely on travel and hospitality are still negatively impacted. There are still travel bans across the world. Um, travel is, is primarily located to you know, domestic travel and especially in some of those developing countries, they really do uh, rely on visitors from uh, high income countries and that has not happened yet, but hopefully soon. Um, there have been rising commodity prices. If you're an exporting country, that's great news. If you're importing, uh, India is a large importer of oil, for example. Um, so that increases uh, costs to the importing countries. Uh, vaccination rates remain very low in many um, emerging economies, and that needs to change for this health crisis to come under control. Um, expect recovery uh, to pre-pandemic levels of economic activity by uh, the end of 2021, maybe the beginning of 2022, depending on uh, which region especially. Longer term though, um, many economies are going to be dealing with debt burdens that got uh, much worse during the pandemic. And the IMF projects that the cumulative per capita income, so the amount of, of income per person over the three years, 2020 to 2022, um, they expect that to be 22% below what was projected to be the case uh, before the pandemic. So, you know, some serious uh, scarring, lasting effects from the pandemic and the economic damage done to many of these, many of these economies. So here, I think the slides will be distributed at some point. Um, and so I'm not gonna go into any great detail, but here are our GDP growth uh, projections for the major economies. Um, so world growth of 6.1%. Um, and I will, in the interest of time, let you all uh, look at that at your own leisure. So turning now to the United States, um, the recovery in the U.S. has accelerated during the first quarter. Um, we've got federal stimulus, uh, vaccination rates, uh, resilient demand um, in, in 
both goods and increasingly in services. We're starting to see the service sector really start to come back online. Um, expectations continue to improve. Um, so we had a 3.5% decline in uh, US GDP. Uh, we're expecting that to rebound 6.4%, uh, a very, very high growth rate coming out of the gate. 4.3% uh, uh, growth in 2022, uh, which is well above uh, trend. So we're going to continue uh, rebounding into 2022 and 2023. Uh, consumer spending accounts for 70% of the U.S. economy. Uh, we're seeing uh, good gains there, 7.6% in 2021, uh, with other uh, continued gains in, into 2022. Um, business investment declined 4.4% in 2020 and uh, we're expected to grow 8.2 percent i think there's a discrepancy in the chart there um and then 6.2 percent in uh, uh, 2022 so we're going to see big gains in business investment uh resuming the job market continues to improve um slack remains in in certain industry segments of course hospitality and leisure being the biggest ones um, the unemployment rate is continued to uh, expected to ease. Right now, it's about 6.1%, um, looking at uh, averaging about 5.4% in 2021. Uh, we should be getting closer to full employment by the end of 2022, maybe into 2023. Okay. So these are some of the indicators of, of progress. These are the four indicators that uh, uh, are used to determine when we are in a uh, business cycle expansion versus a business cycle contraction. Um, they have not called the end of the recession that we had last year yet. Uh, they usually wait uh, many months until all of the data are finalized and they can compare all of these trends. Um, I think they'll probably call it for some time in the second quarter, second, third quarter of 2020. Um, but I just want to point out that of these four indicators, only real business sales, that light blue line, has uh, reached pre-pandemic levels. The other uh, three uh, indicators, real personal income, less transfer payments, which is the uh, income, the spending power that the economy has, uh, remains just a little bit lower. Industrial production is that orange line. Uh, we are still below uh, the industrial production trend of where we were pre-pandemic, although part of that is a function of the winter storms. And non-farm payrolls, we still have a lot of progress uh, to, to make before we um, get back to back to normal on, on payrolls. And the economy lost about 22 million jobs, or about two-thirds of, of the recoup on that. So uh, this is our chemical activity barometer. It's a very interesting piece of research that my boss put together, um, and I use a lot in these presentations because I think it does a really good job. Um, because of the position of the chemical industry in the broader industrial supply chain, changes early on changes in chemical activity can predict uh, changes in overall industrial activity a few months ahead. So uh, the CAB, the CAB rose 1.2% in May. Uh, this is data I think was just released or will shortly be released. Uh, so you guys might be getting a little bit of a preview. Um, it was up 18.6%, but again, we're looking at base year effects. So we're comparing May 2021 to May 2020 when we were still um, in, in quite a lockdown situation. Uh, the trends in construction related resins and uh, performance chemistry specialty chemicals were especially strong. Um, and the cab is consistent with continued expansion of the U.S. industrial sector through mid-2021. So as I mentioned, uh, there's been a lot of progress in uh, the labor market. And uh, although the, the April jobs numbers did disappoint, we'll get a read on May next week. Um, you know, still good gains, but, you know, it is slowing uh, the, the rate of, of payroll, uh, non-farm payrolls expansion. We do expect to recoup those, those remaining 8 million jobs um, probably within the next year or so, um, and then expand after that. There are a lot of interesting things going on in the labor market. The unemployment insurance claims data came out this morning. These are the first time filing for unemployment insurance. I think it came in around 406,000 uh, for last week. 
um, which is down considerably from where we were. It's the lowest rate in over a year, I think, uh, uh, since really the, the early days of, of the pandemic and the lockdowns. However, it still remains quite high um, historically. So I think you know there's still a lot of uh, churn happening in the labor market. Uh, a lot of folks are still filing for these first-time unemployment claims, uh, reflecting layoffs or small businesses that may be going out of business that couldn't hang on. Um, so there's a lot of work to be done. The unemployment rate I mentioned was 6.1% uh, for April. Um, that's the U3 measure. So the, the Labor Department puts out a couple of different measures of unemployment. Uh, there's also a U6 measure, which is a broader measure of unemployment and includes things like uh, discouraged workers, people who kind of stop looking for work because um, they can't find anything, people who are working part-time, but they would rather be working full-time. Um, that measure remains quite high, it's over 10%. Um, so there still is a lot of hurt going on in the economy. There's, um, you know, it's, it's sort of a conundrum to some degree because we see these job openings numbers, you know, there are more job openings now than unemployed people. You know, why can't, why can't there be a better uh, matchup? And there's a couple of reasons for that. Um, part of it is, you know, some workers may be reluctant to go back to work because of COVID um, or they may have to take public transportation um, and they're nervous about doing that, you know, depending on their vaccination status. Uh, there's a lot of places that are still closed, um, uh, school systems that are still closed. I think I saw a statistic that 60% of US school systems um, are still not back full time. Uh, so uh, childcare is an issue for many, many workers. Um, there's also a skills mismatch issue. You might have an unemployed restaurant worker, but that restaurant worker can't necessarily uh, start driving a truck. Um, so there may be some skills mismatch uh, accounting for that. And finally, um, there is uh, some concern that extended unemployment benefits are uh, creating disincentives for people to work, especially at the low income level. So some interesting things going on in the labor market. <coughs> so inflation and interest rates, this has been a topic of great interest. And uh, I have a slide at the very end of the presentation of things that keep me up awake, keep me up at night. And this is definitely one of them. So, you know, the April report for the consumer price index, which is that light blue line. Um, in the April report, we saw a surge in consumer prices. It was at uh, the core, you know, if you exclude food and energy prices, which are constantly moving up and down, the core inflation rate rose 0.9% uh, for the month. That was compared to February. That was the largest monthly gain since 1982. Um, on a year over year basis, it was up uh, 3%, which was the, the largest annual gain since 1996. Although again, we've got some base year effects in there. We're comparing against April of 2020 when everything was in lockdown. Um, but if you look at the details of the report, Really, the consumer prices were driven by um, a couple of categories, and those reflect uh, sort of demand-driven uh, surges as people are coming out of pandemic mode. Uh, used cars uh, rose just on a monthly basis. Used cars were up uh, 10%. Um, there's a lot of return to office. Uh, people may be reluctant to take tra public transportation. Uh, rental car fleets, which uh, shed cars left and right uh, uh, during the pandemic, are now purchasing back all of these used cars. Um, new car sales have been hampered. Uh, production has been hampered by a global shortage of semiconductors and polyurethanes and some other materials. Um, so used car uh, prices were a big part of that increase. Um, but also things like restaurant meals and hotels and airline tickets. So we're starting to see some of that service sector spending come up and it's, uh, you know, there's a little bit of a, a gap between, you know, people uh, reduced capacity during the pandemic and now it's starting to come back up. So now we have demand outstripping supply in some of these categories. Um, so, at the same time, we've had the money supply um, climbing dramatically over uh, the pandemic due to uh, monetary policy interventions. Uh, money supply has grown to 50 year high. Um, so this isn't a guarantee of higher inflation or systemic higher inflation, um, but it certainly is a risk factor. Um, the real risk in my opinion is that the short term inflation 
expectations translate into longer term inflation expectations. So one of the reasons that we've enjoyed uh, relatively low inflation over the past uh, several decades has been uh, lower uh, inflation expectations. So if that were to shift, if there were to be a rollover in those expectations, that could be um, uh, destabilizing to, to price levels. But uh, the punchline is, you know, most economists, the consensus view is that the uh, increase in inflation that we have seen in April and probably will continue to see for several months is transitory in nature and that um, it will revert back to trend. And that is certainly our forecast. We're looking for um, you know, inflation to rise 2.8% in 2022, uh, 2021 rather, um, and then fall back to a 2.3% uh, uh, gain in 2022, which is above trend, um, but then continuing to edge lower. I think our 2023 forecast is 2.1%. Um, so we're not expecting to see runaway inflation. Um, you know, price pressures are certainly building um, in the commodities area. Um, you know, back in the 70s and 80s, there was a much tighter correlation between commodity price increases and overall price level inflation. Um, and there's a couple of reasons that that has, uh, you know, we've we've seen a, a lower inflation climate. Um, you know, up until very recently, there was a lower uh, growth in the money supply. Um, those low inflation expectations that I mentioned. Also globalizations, right? So you've got uh, international uh, competitors keeping prices, price levels relatively low. And finally, uh, demographics, certainly in the developed world, there's a different consumption pattern between you know, an aging population and a very young population, uh, which has been uh, deflationary. Well, not deflationary, just not increasing inflation. It's uh, kind of kept a damper on it. So, and, and a lot of those conditions remain in place. So in my opinion, I think this is a, a transitory uh, phenomenon that we're gonna see. But at the same time, we've seen um, uh, treasury rates. So the 10 year treasury rates, interest rates are starting to creep back up. We saw an all time low 0.89% uh, 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 10 year treasury rate in uh, 2020, but that is coming back up. And that has fueled uh, low, low mortgage rates and uh, shifting patterns of remote work and remote learning um, has shifted uh, uh, home buying activity. This is another area where we're seeing some, some real price pressures um, in, in home sales. Uh, I, several reports have come out in the past week um, on home sales and home sale prices. And I, I don't remember the exact data, but they're really quite uh, shocking and, and record setting. The, the inventories are unable to keep up with the demand for new housing. Um, so this is existing home sales and new home sales. And uh, you know, existing home sales actually fell in uh, April because they just uh, couldn't keep up. I think they fell in, in March and April. I think that's a two month decline. Um, just not enough homes available for sale. And that's really uh, been driving up the prices there. So looking at some of our key end juice markets for chemistry, um, housing I mentioned, uh, and, and that has led, you know, the demand for housing has led to an increase in uh, home building activity. So during 2020, most industries saw contraction, uh, vehicles, uh, you know, across the board contractions uh, at large sectors, the construction construction sector. Um, housing starts actually rose in 2020 up to 1.4 million. Um, we expect further gains, um, 1.59 uh, million in 2021, uh, slightly slower pace, but still um, above where we've been in the previous few years going into uh, 2022. Vehicles, uh, we had a 14.4 million rate in uh, 2020 during the pandemic. We expect that to rebound, averaging 17 million uh, this year and next. We may have to walk back from that a little bit because of the production declines that are happening in the vehicle sector. There's been a global shortage of semiconductors. Um, polyurethane foam, I know, is also uh, in short supply in other materials. And uh, Ford and GM and other automakers are actually uh, curbing production. They're slowing their production down, idling lines until they can uh, reestablish these supply chains. Um, so we may need to, to walk back from that a little bit. So I mentioned construction spending. There's been a, uh, a real shift in construction spending over the previous several years. Um, the 
the bulk of well, the bulk of the growth in construction spending has come from the non-residential sector. Uh, we're starting to see that flip um, with strong growth rates in uh, residential construction, so new build, uh, a single and multifamily, uh, but also improvements. You know, people are stuck at home uh, during COVID. I've certainly made improvements to my home um, during that time. And I think a lot of others as well. So that has really fueled some of the um, uh, construction spending going into the residential sector. Uh, over the next five years, we expect to see uh, large gains in new single family uh, residential improvements continuing, but also depending on the uh, exact structure of the stimulus, uh, the infrastructure bill rather, the American Jobs Plan, um, which includes a lot of uh, infrastructure spending, there could be a, a surge in federally funded construction as well. Um, state and local budgets have become constrained during the downturn, uh, so we expect to see uh, less growth coming from uh, uh, state and local sectors, so uh, schools and, and some road construction. So this is the heat map um, that I put together uh, showing sort of the relative performance, not relative performance, the actual performance of these industries. The, the way this is sorted, if you look at the column for 2021, the industries are sorted uh, from our expectations from high to low. Um, so we see you know, very, very strong rebound growth in the durable goods uh, sector, uh, motor vehicles, aircraft, appliances, iron and steel. Uh, we see a big rebound in petroleum refining uh, that's tied to mobility, uh, both auto and aviation, um, and some of these other categories. Down at the bottom, um, oil and gas extraction continues to uh, be challenged. Uh, printing, uh, folks are not uh, going to you know, the office as much, or at least certainly during the first part of the year. So printing um, and, and paper have had uh, uh, slower um, growth prospects. Printing is actually declining. Uh, paper, we've got 3.9% in there. Um, industrial production, we expect to rebound. I think it fell 6.7% last year. We're expecting a rebound of 5.5% uh, before growing to 4.3% in 2022. Um, and we see growth across most industry sectors. So let me talk a little bit about the supply chain challenges. Uh, we had winter storm Yuri uh, that came through in um, February and knocked out a huge amount of uh, chemical and refining capacity. Uh, this is uh, net crude imports to Gulf Coast refineries. Um, you know, this is important, at least to the chemical industry, because about half of propylene is coming from uh, uh, refineries. I'm going to speed up a little bit because I want to get through this so we can have time for questions. Um, we have been tracking sort of the capacity outages for U.S. basic chemical capacity since mid-February when the storms came through. Um, recent improvement uh, has occurred. So, you know, a month ago we still were reporting uh, significant outages, um, but now it's uh, less than 3% or around 3% is offline based on data from ICIS. Um, some of the the reasons for you know why it took so long to get some of these facilities up it was you know geographically you know a hurricane is is very narrow in its focus and this freeze took out wide swaths of capacity along the u.s gulf coast mostly in texas but also in louisiana louisiana fared better by the way because uh as the cold temperatures moved across um, it actually was daytime uh, when it hit louisiana whereas it was nighttime in texas so it, those temperatures were were that much colder uh, there were cascading impacts across uh, large parts of the U.S. chemical industry uh, because there were shortages of raw materials coming from the Gulf Coast. An example of this is styrene. Um, styrene is, is made in the Gulf Coast and then uh, uh, either barged or, or rail uh, up to uh, facilities making polystyrene in the Midwest and other parts of the country. Um, there are some facilities that uh, continued to be offline. They decided it was a good time to do maintenance. But as I said, uh, most of the, the restarts have occurred. And this is a heat map. Um, ICIS provided really good coverage of uh, what capacities were down um, at various points in time. And so this is these are selected chemicals and kind of the recovery track. And you can see, you know, February through, you know, really mid-April, late April, a lot of capacity remained down. 
um, starting at the beginning of May, and that's when we started to get news that a lot of these facilities were, were up and running, and green represents, you know, 100% uh, that all of that capacity that had gone offline had been restored. But really, the winter storm points to broader supply chain challenges. Um, before February, inventories were tight across multiple chemistries. Um, and this is part of that whole story about the, the manufacturing rebound, uh, not only in the US, but, but globally. Um, you know, we had pandemic related production curtailments. Um, we had hurricanes, Laura and Delta. There were some facilities along the Gulf Coast that had just gotten back online from the hurricanes from last season uh, when the freeze hit. Um, but we've seen, you know, sort of logistical transportation challenges in other areas. We have that blockage in the Suez Canal, uh, the Mississippi River, um, and other logistics challenges. You know, port congestion was a, a big problem that is easing now, um, but port congestion, there were container ships moored outside of Long Beach for uh, weeks at a time. There have been continued and exacerbated uh, driver shortages um, in the trucking sector. Um, and a global uh, shortage of containers, just not enough containers to move all of the stuff that needs to go places. Um, so there, you know, we still have these, these broad um, supply chain challenges. And there are a number of end use markets that are facing um, shortages of chemicals and plastics. Uh, we've heard from all kinds of industries uh, trying to get a handle on this medical supply, furniture because of the polyurethane foam in particular, um, uh, vehicles, building and construction. I have a colleague uh, at the Associated General Contractors uh, Association, their chief economist has reached out to me many times to find out what the situation is. Uh, food and beverage, so in, in for plastics especially, you know, being able to, to package milk, uh, for example, requires high density polyethylene, which uh, some capacity was offline as recently as last week, but, um, but those are largely coming back. So now turning to our, chemist, our chemicals outlook. Um, so this is US chemistry uh, rebounding from the pandemic recession. The data labels there are just for the headline chemicals. It was just too messy to, to put them up and I talk about them in more detail in the following slides. Um, but we saw 3.6% decline in 2020, which actually was better than many other manufacturing industries. Um, we had a lot of support from uh, the basic chemicals, you can see that little pink bar is, is slightly negative. It was actually positive for fertilizers and uh, plastic resins. Uh, plastic resin production actually increased during the pandemic because of all of the PPE that was needed, uh, medical supplies, those uh, uh, barriers that you see in stores and restaurants now, a lot of uh, plastic demand. Uh, from that. Looking into uh, 2021, uh, we're only expecting about 2.2% growth, and uh, that has been shaved considerably because of uh, the winter storms. So if you look at the industrial production index for basic chemicals uh, between uh, February and March, or Jan I'm sorry, January and February, so 25% month on month decline. If you look at organic chemicals that go into any number of materials, and I think pine chemicals are included in that organic chemicals um, category, it was a, it was a, a monthly decline of, of 31%. Uh, we're, we've seen a huge rebound from that, but that um, did take a, a toll, I think, on those uh, year-end numbers. So we're uh, expecting slightly slower growth in uh, chemicals, but you can see uh, continued growth throughout the uh, forecast, slightly higher growth in 2022 because it does not include those, those winter storm impacts. So looking at basic industrial chemical production um, and synthetic materials, again, I'm not going to go through the details of this, um, but we do see this, this rebound in um, materials that slightly dampened for that 2021 um, uh, timeframe because of the winter storms. Specialty chemicals. Um, so specialty chemicals fell 10.8% in 2020. Uh, that was a function of these, you know, end use markets that absolutely had the, you know, carpet pulled from underneath them. Um, and specialty chemicals followed. Uh, we've seen rebounding growth in 2021. Uh, we're looking for uh, a growth of 3.8% in specialty chemicals this year, uh, accelerating even further into 2022. Uh, coatings in particular, um, looking for a 2.5% growth this year. Um, and 5.5% next year. Um, other specialty chemicals, so adhesives and all of these other categories, a um, uh, little bit stronger growth for 4.3% this year um, and 35 in 2022. 
So this is, uh, I think, the last slide I've got on the chemicals. We are looking at, uh, this is looking at the year-to-date uh, performance, kind of the year-over-year -year comparison. I'm comparing uh, January through April of 2021 with January through April of 2020. Um, 21 of the 28 functional and market segments uh, posted growth in 2021. Um, this measures demand. The chart I showed before measured production. So there's a slight difference in, in the numbers there, and that's uh, the reason. So the demand fell, oops, uh, fell 7% in 2020. Um, through April, um, year over year, it's still off about 0.8%. Uh, that's you know, the oil field chemicals, as I mentioned, oil and gas extraction remains uh, pretty pretty constrained. Uh, we're expecting a turnaround later this year, uh, but uh, so far that has been uh, down considerably um, uh, for that period, and that's been uh, dragging the rest of it down. Now, oil field chemicals is a fairly large volume component of this overall index. Um, the top 10, we've got rubber processing chemicals. Again, you know, these are base year effects. We're looking at uh, the comparison against last year when the motor vehicle sector and tire manufacturing um, and therefore rubber manufacturing uh, fell it was close to like 90% uh, because of the pandemic. So we're seeing a rebound effect from that, but also electronic chemicals against semiconductor shortage. The semiconductor guys are going all out um, and some of these other categories as well. So just to kind of wrap it up, um, we've got this economic recovery that began uh, almost a year ago, really. Uh, probably June, July timeframe, August. Um, it's accelerating in the U.S. Uh, that's a function of the vaccines and, and the relaxing of restrictions. Uh, we're starting to see those price pressures. Uh, it, demand is growing. Um, we've got supply chain bottlenecks, and that's causing some, some price pressures. Uh, so we're going to keep an eye on that. Globally, many other economies are expanding um, as their case rates decline, um, and the share of their populations that become vaccinated increases and they can open up their economies. Um, so that's what we're, that's kind of the, the core theme of this is the health crisis needs to go away before we can uh, totally reopen and see uh, accelerating growth. And there's a lot of uncertainties. Uh, many things keep us up awake, keep us up at night. And so these are some of the things that uh, I certainly think about and I think are, are uh, risks to this outlook and risks to the global economy. I mean, I think number one is is what happens with COVID, uh, right? We've got all of these uh, variants of concern um, that are emerging uh, to the extent that the vaccines are uh, remain effective against them, I think is, a, is an uncertainty that remains to be completely clarified. Um, you know, if there's a resurgence, then, then all bets are off, I think. Um, tighter financial conditions. So we right now, uh, uh, monetary authorities around the world have been uh, very, very supportive, providing lots of stimulus. If uh, conditions tighten too quickly, uh, that could be a risk uh, to this outlook. Uh, yeah, we've got these persistent disruptions from COVID, uh, labor participation rates, uh, mismatch. I think I mentioned some of these uh, things earlier in the presentation. You know, to the extent that there are underlying uh, damaging effects to these economies, you know, the debt burdens in emerging markets, things like that, uh, that could that could be destabilizing. Um, there's been social unrest in many parts of the world. Um, that is is a risk. I've got the uh, uh, gilets jaunes. Uh, in the lower left here. Um, and, and food price inflation is one of those things that I think uh, could trigger some social unrest, uh, broadly speaking. Um, increased frequency of natural disasters. I've got a hurricane there, but it could be um, really just about anything. Uh, that could be incredibly disruptive, uh, not only to the economies, but to those uh, supply chains. And you know, we're seeing cybersecurity uh, pop up as one of those things that uh, you know could really uh, be disruptive, those supply chain uh, disruptions. I live in the Washington DC area. So when the Colonial Pipeline went down, that was um, uh, a real wake up call for folks. Um, you know, we could, uh, I live in an area where all of the gas stations ran on empty after about Wednesday. There were two or three days where there was no gas within a 20 mile drive of my house. Um, you know, geopolitical risks, we continue to see tension between uh, the United States and China. 
Um, you know, there, there has been uh, not a lot of progress on walking back from some of the tariffs that were imposed uh, in 2018, 2019 timeframe. And finally, I think I've talked about a good bit about inflation. Um, you know, to the extent that those long-term inflation expectations uh, shift to a higher path, um, that that could lead to to broader um, uh, inflation pressures, and that could be destabilizing as well. And I think uh, with that, I'm ready to take some questions. Let's see. I'm gonna... All right. <laughs> Okie dokie. So it looks like we did not. Can you hear me, Wendy? Yes. Okay. All right. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, wanted to make sure everyone could hear me there. Um, so it looks like uh, we don't have any questions that have come through at the moment other than this one, and it's coming from Nelson Lawson, and he is asking, is there a survey of inflation expectations? Oh, yeah, yeah, they're actually, I think it's the Federal uh, Reserve of Philadelphia. Don't quote me on that. I think one of the Federal Reserve banks does do um, a survey of inflation expectations. And I think that, yeah, they have been sort of trending trending up, but, um, you know, I think the consensus view is that, you know, this is supply chain related, this is related to uh, the, the shifting patterns of consumer behavior, you know, this rapid um, changeover from, you know, pandemic holding tight to going out and doing things again. Um, and that, that the inflation that we saw in April and we'll likely see, um, you know, for several more months is, is transitory and that we will go back to um, a more, moderate uh, uh, inflation trajectory. Okay. I see that one. Did we have any other questions for Martha? If you do, um, feel free to raise your hand. Oh, I see one here. Andrew, um, looks like Andrew had a question. Go ahead, Andrew. Uh, Martha, first, thank you. Excellent presentation. Um, and, and very insightful, not just the information, the insight that you've provided and the, uh, the verve that's behind it. So thank you. Um, certainly, uh, oil field uh, is, is a, big, uh, a big nut, as you, as you explained. Um, are you able to break out at all uh, some of the differences or expectations going forward between like drilling, production chemicals, that type of thing? I don't have that level of detail. Um, yeah, that you know, it's, it's kind of a basket of uh, specialty chemicals, and it's it's a large volume um, basket. I don't have the detail about yeah, drilling mugs versus profits and things like that. Okay, thanks. No, I'm saying in general, like drilling of new wells versus uh, production or oil coming out of existing wells. Got it. Okay. Um, well, the rig counts have been coming back up. Um, I don't know. You probably are, are very familiar with the Baker Hughes rig count. I don't. I think it's yes, 455 yes. last week with oil and gas. Um, so those have been coming back up. They're still not uh, where they were before the pandemic by any stretch. Um, but there is uh, continued uh, drilling activity. Okay, I'm not sure exactly where. I mean, I would assume like the Permian and some of the, the places you would expect it. Um, but yeah, the, those are the ring counts are continuing to increase. We do track that on a weekly basis. I know the last couple of weeks have been um, increased. Great, thank you. Okay, did we have any other questions for Martha? You're welcome to raise your hand through the app or send a question over to us. Okay. Well, we uh, appreciate you, Martha, as always. Um, I think that you're providing us, hopefully, um, with a little hope, a little faith that we're going to rebound. Um, I know certainly um, we are seeing some increases already this year, and I think the expectation is that as the vaccine continues to roll out and we get back to business as to whatever type of normal that will look like um, that we will see some of these supply chains come back online and we will see 
some of these increases that, that we're expecting. So um, I did mention to everyone through the email, um, but I will say it. Um, as always, all of our presentations are available after the event is over. So if you would like to take a greater look at Martha's presentation, we are making that available to you. We'll be sending information to you after the event with the link to that. Um, and Martha's information is contained in her presentation. So if you have additional questions, you're always welcome to reach out to her. She's been so gracious to present to us and to answer many questions from our members. So Martha, thank you very much for your presentation. And we look forward to an update from you that hopefully will exceed the expectations that you provided <laughs> to us so far <laughs> for the That's second half. So. Thank All right. you. Well, thanks. It's always a pleasure. All right. Thank you. Okay, so we're gonna move right along into our meeting now. Let's make sure I can get my screen up. It looks like it's there on the going forward. Okay, so moving right along, we're gonna get into our financial report. And first of all, I just have to say what a year. I know that everyone has been, um, have their own set of challenges, but I think that the one thing that we've all learned and earned <laughs> is a great deal of gratitude and humility. I know certainly we've all had a number of evolving responsibilities um, during this unplanned and adverse situation. And that this pandemic placed pressures in our lives that we did not know existed. Um, certainly with most everyone involved with us, generally being on the road at some point that all of our on the road travelers now having to come back home and work full time and a home office and isolation and being with the family so much more, especially for those of us who've had children who are also being virtually schooled um, and coupled with the tragedy that we've all suffered in some form with losing people to sickness or to COVID, the list just goes on. And with that, I know that we haven't had the calmest of times, but despite all of this, our jobs as leaders have never changed. And I think that as we are moving forward, we're seeing that it's our role to make the whole of our industry greater than the sum of its sectors. I think that this is paramount as we move forward and we adapt to our ever-changing uh, world landscape. So with that, I'm going to get into some updates of what's been happening with the PCA. Um, as we get into an update, I want to start by saying that this is a year of growth. It will be continued growth. And I'm envisioning a PCA and our organization as an organization that's inclusive of all pine products that have environmentally and socially responsible life cycles. Um, I think that this is going to require a collaborative industry effort in such a way that our collaboration transcends competition. Um, I think that as people learn about the PCA, it's hard to forget us, but so many people don't know that we exist or what our industry does. So with that, my goal for this year and for the continuance of PCA as part of our strategic vision is to take PCA from being unknown to unforgettable. So I'm gonna leave you with that as we get into some updates. All right. So this year in our financials, um, 2020 again was like a year um, of no other. Um, our financials and our statement of activities, uh, we did have a net loss of around $152,000. We're a nonprofit, and so that was a big blow to us. But thankfully, through the years, we had um, had some good success, and so we we're able to continue the PCA without um, too many changes, except for budgetary 
um, constraints. The biggest um, challenge that we faced in 2020 was the fact that we could not have any of our conferences. So our conferences make up a big portion of our revenue base, but it also makes up a big portion of what we provide to the PCA. Um, our dues and subscription fees um, had increased because we did join some additional um, groups to stay abreast and apprised of things that were happening, um, and compliance issues, regulatory issues, and other issues that were happening in 2020 going into 2021 that we now need to stay uh, more apprised of. Of course, the net loss did affect our balance sheet. Um, with our balance sheet, we will notice some changes happening for 2021. Um, under our reserve for AR, that will actually change. Uh, we did apply for a PPP loan here in the United States um, as part of the CARES Act, and we, we received that for a portion of some of the salaries, and that has been forgiven this year. Um, additionally, I'll discuss this a little further, but some of our prepaid expenses you'll see in 2020, um, those were much higher. Those actually uh, are funds that were sent for paying for our uh, hotel deposits and other event and meeting deposits. So uh, most of all of the, most of those have been returned to us at this point. Our deferred dues are um, our membership dues that are held in reserve until the services are provided each month. So meetings and events. Meetings and events are one of the greatest opportunities that we have for our members and for the industry itself. So we have planned the 2022 spring meeting. Um, it has been rescheduled to the 27th through the 29th of April of 2022. Um, that is a reschedule to PGA National Resort and Spa, and that's in Palm Beach Gardens, Florida. The location is actually very accessible through three of the international airports. So we're hoping that that will provide greater access to you to attend next year. Um, with that, they have a phenomenal space of indoor and outdoor space. This is the actual hotel and the location that the Honda Classic is held at. Um, they actually did hold the Honda Classic this year with over 10,000 people attending. So they have plenty of space to accommodate us both inside and outside, um, depending upon what guidelines we have in place and measures are still in place to have social distancing and a very safe and efficient meeting. They do have some private meeting rooms. And so uh, with this being our first face-to-face -face meeting coming back in to 2022, if there are some of you who plan to attend and anticipate that you would like a private meeting room, please contact me and let me know so I can go ahead and put those um, on reserve well in advance so we have that space earmarked for you. Um, speaking of the meetings, I know that it was a difficult decision for the board and the PCA to not hold meetings this year. However, it was our duty of care to ensure the safety and well-being of all participants. And as Martha mentioned, with the unevenness and rollout of vaccine schedules being different worldwide, we want to ensure that our next face-to-face -face meeting is inclusive of everyone who can possibly attend. I will say that, um, Martha mentioned the meetings and the events industry, and um, she's correct that that industry is a tremendous um, financial portion of the sector. It's a $1.5 trillion global industry. And the meetings industry was the first to shut down during this pandemic, and it's also the last to come back on, uh, online. So we are starting to see people having face-to-face -face meetings again, but a lot of those have been more domestic or regionally related. So as we go into 2022, with the basis of having safety and security in mind, we will be releasing some code of conduct for our attendees with recommendations that have come through the meetings and events industry. 
for face-to-face uh, -face meetings and some protocols that we should follow. So we'll be in touch shortly to um, open everything up for the spring meeting. I know a good number of you had registered in 2020. And so for those of you who had a registration and credit on your account, we will be transferring those over if you would like, and we'll secure and lock your place in at the 2020 registration rate. Okay, going into the 2022 International Conference, um, we did have to cancel and terminate the meeting in Dublin. Unfortunately, um, Dublin, level of restrictions have been at a very um, high level. They've been at a level five for over a year, with the exception of just a few weeks here or there. Um, they, are, they were not confident that we could host a safe meeting and ensure that we could receive all of our travelers into Ireland for 2021. So we did have to make the tough choice to terminate that meeting. With that being said, we are soliciting for the 2022 um, mid-September to late September date. Uh, we are primarily looking at Helsinki as a location. Um, not certain of to where, whether the date availability or the hotel and conference space will be enough for our group, but the board has agreed that there are a good number of options for other business or potential pre or post conferences that we could implement again, which we did in the past, um, if we hold it in that location. Um, additionally, um, if Helsinki is not the location, we will continue to look in the European area and we'll be discussing uh, with our Finland based um, companies and possible sponsorships as well as the potential of hosting some additional education, uh, educational content in the future. Um, many of you may remember that we hosted a recovery course in the past, and there has been a great deal of interest expressed from our European um, refineries that they are interested in, in holding a recovery course in the future there. So those discussions will um, be starting this year, so we can see if that's something that's a feasible possibility in the near future. Going into the rest of 2021 and our anticipation is that uh, we will continue in a virtual conference format. Um, we did learn a lot in the virtual conference format that we employed in 2020, and so we're going to work to improve upon that with this year's program. So we are in the process of designing some free and low cost webinars for the community. So we are very appreciative uh, to Martha Moore for starting us off with this first meeting um, and our annual meeting. So uh, this webinar, along with anything that we held last year or in the past is available on our website and all of those will be available on, excuse me, on our YouTube channel as well. So with this, um, Part of the goal for our future webinars or potential lunch and learns are to make sure that we're expanding opportunities for all stakeholders within, within the pine products industry. So part of this is increasing our outreach and inclusion of all pine related topics that do bring that responsible value to our industry. So one of the next ones that we're working on is dealing with biorenewables, um, working with BDC and then Thorpe to bring a presentation along with one of the presentations uh, on biorenewables within the oleoresin market or gum rosin sector um, that I am working on with uh, Mariana, one of our board members, as well as um, a couple others that we can truly have a biorenewable Panel. We know that this is something that is um, happening. It's something that we need to embrace. So we're hoping to pull together that panel within the next few months to offer that to you as a half day program. With that in mind, um, if there's something of particular interest to you, or if you have a paper that you would like to share, 
I have opened up a call for papers. And uh, this year we're focusing on the future of pine chemicals in a time of crisis. So we're going to be doing several different webinar and lunch and learn formats. Some will be papers, uh, presentations, some will be research-based, and some will be some pre-organized panels. So if you have ideas for something in the future, please let me know um, what we can do to uh, meet your expectations or to cover a topic that's of broad interest to the industry or to your particular sector. Okay, so membership. Uh, we did lose some members in 2020. Um, some of these were from retirement. Um, others were from certain sectors of those companies that are uh, no longer involved within the pine chemicals product sector. And others are just some that were non-renewal. We have gained five new members this year. And so this is increasing um, our opportunity to grow the PCA and expand our outreach and our footprint. So with that, I'm going to go just very quickly through to introduce some of our new members. Um, Carrie Thompson um, recently retired. He's a consultant and he's coming to us as a single person consultant with more than 40 years of experience in the pine chemicals and specialty chemicals industry. Um, he does provide uh, additional consulting on the side, and I'm happy to provide his contact information to you, or if you're a member, it is available on our website. So welcome, Terry. Next, we have Oleochem Analytics, and this is uh, Leela Landris Perez. A good number of you may recognize her name. Uh, she was previously with ISIS and has now um, started her own company, so I know she's been um, participating with some additional conferences as a speaker and panelist. And so we're very happy to have her join the PCA. Um, she has done presentations for us in the past. And so keep her name in mind. I'm sure we'll be hearing from Leela in the future. STEM Group is actually coming to us uh, from Belarus. It's uh, our very first company from Belarus. So we're very happy to have uh, them on as a processor. Um, they are increasing uh, their materials. Previously, they were involved just with road marking, but they are actually into uh, production and processing now. So welcome to them. Fuji and Green Pine Chemicals is coming back to us. They were previously a member, and so we'd like to welcome them back. Um, they are a Chinese uh, turpentine company, and so they participated with PCA events in the past. We're very happy to have them back as a user. As well as Param Perhatani. Um, they are in the gum rosin and gum turpentine sector as many other uh, non-wood and wood sectors outside of pine. Uh, they're coming to us from Indonesia. They were a previous member. And so we're very happy to have them back with us as a member. We look forward to seeing them again in person. Um, we do actually have some prospective members that we're working on. As I mentioned earlier on, one of the goals of the PCA is to increase our outreach and increase our footprint and to grow our industry. So with that, I do have uh, eight prospective members that I'm working with now to try and increase our participation with the PCA. So if, there, if you're not a member of the PCA and if you would like to join, we'd love to welcome you. Um, I'd be happy to speak to you further, and I'll provide my contact information details to you so that uh, we can get you joined as a member and participating with some of our committees. So that leads me into our committee slides, and so incredibly proud of our committees. We truly do some, have highly successful um, committees that are organized and focused on specific industry priorities, issues, and initiatives. And they're working with our member companies, industry partners, government entities, and other representatives to ensure that we're staying apprised of local and international regulations, standard changes, compliance issues, and information that we can share to benefit your company. So one of the greatest things that we tried to work on with our committees 
is to increase our international participation. And I'd like to do a call for action for you all to say that everyone who's a member of the PCA should have representation on our committees. We do have three very active committees and have some additional committees that we're working to reinvigorate. So I would suggest that if you or someone within your team um, could benefit from being part of our product regulatory stewardship committee, our testing committee, our environmental health and safety committee, please let us know. Uh, you will find something in our annual report that's a contact us link to let us know you're interested. So we will put that call for action out there to please welcome you and encourage you to join one of our committees. They truly are doing some tremendous work. And so I'll get right into that. Okay, so our EHS committee, um, a lot of you are familiar with what they do, but I'll tell you that they are probably one of my more active committees. Um, they typically have calls monthly or every other month and we're having two face-to-face -face meetings a year. Right now, we have uh, condensed those down to all virtual meetings, but there's some great information that comes from this because our wonderful consultant, Joel Anderson, um, stays on top of all of the compliance updates and safety updates that are coming out each year, um, or each month, I apologize. Um, he also is publishing best practices, which are white papers, that are indications and guidances for the industry and your EHS personnel. You'll see that uh, each month we are publishing technical and regulatory industry news. Um, on the screen, you'll see a list of the current um, best practices that are available. So we've got a good number of those that we've been working on building that library the past few years. Um, we generally release a best practice every few months. So please, by all means, pay attention to that page. And as we send that out each month, uh, if, you, if there's someone on your team that could benefit from seeing those best, best practices, then by all means, forward them our email so that they can be on our email list as well. Again, these are some of the regulatory updates that uh, Joel pulls each month from a safety and an environmental um, standpoint. Our PRS committee, which is our product regulatory and stewardship committee, is very active across the world. Right now, so many initiatives that are, are happening, not only here through the US and particularly California, um, there are things happening over in HARPA with REACH uh, changes, as well as Korean REACH, Brazil REACH, UK REACH, and others. Um, so there's a lot of work that's coming out of this committee and is guiding uh, the industry for the changes that are forthcoming. In Canada, uh, Nelson Lawson also represents us on the industry coordinating group. And we spent some significant time this year and last year uh, responding and also sending messages to the legislators to try and remove certain chemicals from toxic lists. Um, some have been successful, some not so much. Um, our PRS committee generally meets every two months. And again, they also, uh, have two face-to-face -face meetings a year, which we're hoping to return in 2022. Each month, our technical alerts are issued along with our regulatory um, updates. And Nelson does a fantastic job of giving us a synopsis or a short summary of some articles that he comes across and archives each month for us um, that are of interest to um, the people within the product regulatory and stewardship sector. Again, this is something that is free that we offer to everyone within the industry. You don't have to be a member to receive these. And so we would encourage you to contact us or to sign up to receive these briefs and updates if you're interested. Okay, leading into our testing committee, we have Phil Hurd and Phil um, is joining us. A good number of you probably remember Jim Russell, and he retired. 
Um, and so we have Phil Hurd, and he has joined us, and he is in the process now of updating all of the pine chemicals test methods, which we will be uh, updating and reissuing on our website. Um, some of those have had some technical changes. Some of those just had a few errors or corrections um, that needed to be updated. And we have a few new methods that will be coming out as well. So we'll be releasing that information shortly to you so that your testing um, and chemistry and analytic folks will have the data that they need. Okay, so the fun stuff, our PCA project. So a good number of you know about our PCA books. You might be able to remember our the yellow book, the Bible, as well as our tall oil and its uses and turpentine books. There are a good number of chapters um, contained within those books that we've been working with um, folks within our industry and um, experts within the industry in order to revise, update, and add new content. So currently, we do have uh, three chapters that are completed, and they are with our commercial artists now and in design so that we can get those laid out. Um, and we have several others that are ready to go into the design process. What does that mean? Uh, that means that hopefully this year, we will be able to start publishing uh, the new uh, revisions um, to update some of the outdated methodologies and ensure that we have a uniform guide um, of research and innovative technology and data available through these publications. These updates are um, keeping in with PCA's vision to ensure that we have updated standards to be able to provide the best guidance and education to PCA members and to the industry. Um, so we're very excited that we will be able to release some updated um, information shortly, and we will be adding some new content that was previously not contained within our book. Um, those are dealing with turpentine fractionation, uh, rosin resin, gum rosin production and processing, pine tree genetics, and we're hoping to also be able to include some content for biorenewables. So we are moving forward with that project and we are very excited to hopefully be able to showcase at least some of this new product and some of the new data that's available to you within the coming months at one of our webinars. Okay, um, moving along to our global industry directory. So one of the things the PCA has rebranded ourselves as is to be the global resource for the pine chemicals industry. And the only way that we can do that is if we have a list of all organizations and products and services that are offered within the pine chemicals industry worldwide. So we do have a directory that we have been building and we will be launching this year. We just need more information and the information we need is from you. We need you to pitch your company. We need you to tell us a summary of your company. What products do you sell? What products do you buy? So that we can include that with our directory. Our listings are free right now. Member listings will always be free in the future. But we are working on that. And in our annual report and on our website, if you go and click on directory, you will find just a very simple form that's our global industry directory um, page to complete the information for where you fall within the industry sector and to provide more information about your company and services. So you will see new things that are coming on this year. Um, a member company spotlight is one of those. So we put together just a quick um, spotlight on cargo logistics. Uh, this is just an idea of what we will be doing each month to spotlight one of our member companies. Hence the reason we need information on your company. We can go and find information from your website, but if there's something specifically that you want to share or a message that you would like us to put out there as we feature your member company, then let us know. 
put that information in the global directory so that we have it or send us an email so we can add it to your profile. Okay, so moving along, many of us know about SWOT analysis, so strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And as I'm coming into the PCA as your president, although I've been with the PCA for nearly nine years, it's important for me to fully understand the wants, needs, and expectations of our members and of the industry. So with that, we're going to conduct our first ever Pine Chemicals Industry Worldwide Opinion Poll. And these are just simple questions um, to identify international trends, issues, topics, um, so that we can set the priorities for the PCA. Your responses are crucial for us to be able to guide our efforts on future monitoring, advocacy, and collaborative efforts so that we can grow the PCA into an inclusive, innovative, and valuable organization for another 25 years. The PCA is 74 years old and we've come so far, but we still have so many opportunities to grow. And that's what I'm asking you for. I'm asking you for your very candid feedback. It will only come to PCA. It will not be released to anyone else so that we can take your insight and your guidance and use that for our strategic planning and our priorities. So this is available on the website. It also was included in our um, annual report that was sent out yesterday. With that being said, my job, I think, um, is to make the whole of our industry greater than the sum of its parts. And so with that, in order for me to fully understand all of your wants and needs and expectations, and also to learn more about your individual company so that as I'm speaking to someone or someone contacts me, needing a consultant, needing a specific product, I have that information for them. So I've tried to make my calendar as transparent as possible to where you can schedule a 30 minute call for me. At the bottom of my signature line uh, for every email that goes out, you will see uh, a calendar um, option in order to schedule time on my calendar. And I would challenge you to please do so. Um, I can reach out to all of you individually to find a time on your schedule, but I know that your schedules are so busy, so I'm making mine open to you so that hopefully, excuse me, hopefully we can find a time to connect and truly find out what's valuable for you. The PCA can only grow through your insight and your assistance. So that is what I'm looking for. Right, so getting into the business portion of this, uh, we do have a couple elections that need to be done. Um, with that, I had already received uh, proxies. Those were sent out in advance to appoint either Greg McLean or myself um, to substitute as your um, vote or as your proxy for the two proposals that we have. So the first is the election of the board chair and vice chair. And that proposal was to elect Greg McLean of Creighton as chair of our board and Dale Hobson from Simrise as vice chair. These were recommendations by the nominating committee of the PCA board of directors. And this is for a term of one year. Um, we have reached a quorum. Uh, we needed uh, 23 of 34 voting members and we have received the quorum. So with that, um, the quorum is as follows. There are 23 affirmative votes, zero against and zero abstain. So the vote has been called to um, pass proposal number one with Greg McLean and with Dale Hobson as our chair and vice chairman. 
Okay, and the proposal two was to elect the following directors as nominating by the excuse me, nominating committee for a term of one year. And those are Greg McLean with Creton, Dale Hobson of Simrise, Greg Adams with IFF, Michelle Bomosi with Res Paul Forkem, Scott Brown with Plasmine, Dan Dunleavy, Ingevity, Mariana Ferrier with Bocer, Mikio Kakiyama with Lauter, Jamie Kubot with GP, John Flaster with Arkema Armad, Alan Phillips with Aboris, Corey Schneider with DRT, and Anant Sundaram with Eastman. Uh, with this, we received 23 of the 34 voting members. So we do have a quorum. We have 22 for, zero against, and one abstain. So the motion passes for our board of directors for 2021 to 2022. Okay, so with that, I know that that was a lot of information from me and a good bit of talking. So I'm going to see if we uh, have any other questions um, that came in. Uh, let's see here. Wendy, do we have any here? Okay. Uh, with that, I will open up the floor to see if anyone has any questions. I don't see any hands raised at the moment, but I have unmuted all participants. So if anyone has a question, if you'd like to raise your hand, or if you have a question at this time, I'm available to answer any questions you might have. Okay, it does look like we have received just a couple emails that may have copied over that there were some topics that were supposed to be on the presentation this morning. So I'm not sure where those came from. And I apologize because our agenda that we released only reflected Martha Moore and our annual business report. Okay. Well, with that being said, um, Tony, do you have anything further or do any of our board members who are attending have anything further that they would like to say? I know that we have Greg McLean on the line and um, I don't believe we have Dale Hobson on the line any longer, but we do have Greg. So Greg, do you have any closing comments? I have none, Amanda. No, okay. but Nothing really to add, Amanda. Just uh, appreciate everybody attending as we try and get things kind of restarted this year through the PCA and, and, and hopefully get back to normal. Hope everybody is healthy, safe, and uh, business is uh, returning to normal for everybody. Other than that, uh, just uh, looking forward to a better year. Very good. Well, I appreciate everyone for attending. Um, thank you very much. I know that this was a brief meeting and a brief update. As always, if you have any questions, I'm always here to answer questions. If you have those from the annual report or any other questions about our committees or projects that we're working on. Um, with that, I'm very um, excited to lead the PCA this year. I know that we have some great initiatives that we're working on. I've had a conversations with a good number of you already and look forward to some additional conversations with you in the future as we lead the PCA forward into a future where all pine chemicals that have an environmentally and socially responsible life cycle are included and represented. So with that, thank you everyone and I hope that you have a great rest of your week. That's the meeting adjourned.